that I'm coming as a willing vessel to receive your word, God. I pray right now that you would deal with me, God, that there's something in me that is in the way, God, that you would remove it, God. Lord, that I would submit myself, that I would bow myself before you, willing and able to receive your word, God. Lord, don't, don't let me come with my own expectations, God. Don't let me come before you bound, God, but let me give you everything that I am. Amen. Amen. Let me give you everything that I am. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Now we're going to end this the way everything should be ended. With thanksgiving. If God has done anything for you, anything, I don't care what it is. If he woke you up this morning, if he's done anything, I feel that we should give him a moment of thanksgiving, amen, that we should come before him with a grateful heart, amen. Lord, I praise you, God. I thank you right now, God. I thank you for my family, God. I thank you for your for your healing hand upon my wife's body, God. I thank you for your healing hand upon my mother-in-law's body, God. I thank you for my children right now, God, for your hand upon their life, God, that you are, that you are stripping away all the old pain, God, that you are, you are stripping away all the old hurt out of their life, God, that you are providing them with a father figure that can lead them, God. And I praise you and I thank you for it right now, God, because you are worthy of my praise, God. You are worthy of my submission right now, God. I give you honor today. I give you honor today, God. You are grateful. You are gracious and you are holy, God. You are holy, God. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, God. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Now, if I could take just a moment to tell you what God has laid on my heart all day. Amen. Glory, I praise you, God. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. You see, I've been coming to men's conference now for probably a little over 10 years, I'd say. A little over a decade, amen. And from the very beginning, from every service I've ever been in, Men's Conference has been able to challenge me, amen. It's challenged my view of what it means to be a man, amen. That's why I keep coming back year after year, if I could be real with you, because I need that, amen. Amen, because it challenges me to be better, amen. And I got to be honest with you, from the very first service, this is how I know, amen, because I can go back to the very first service that really rocked my world, and I may, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to be transparent here. Um, Scott Graham started me off right, amen, <laughs> when he told me, build your boat right, amen, <laughs> because you got a family that you've got to get to heaven, amen, build your boat right right amen and at the time I didn't even have kids I didn't even have a family I had a wife amen it wasn't until like eight years later nine years later before I have three kids of my own amen to where I understand that truly that I've got to do everything that I can do to be the man that they need not for my own selfish sake you know what I mean not for my own selfish view of what it means to be a man but for their sake amen because I've got to build my boat right to take them to heaven amen um but coming to men's conference, like many of us, I thought it, I knew what it meant to be a man. Amen. Uh, I was a little bit later in life before I come to God, and that's a whole different story. Amen. But I thought I had an understanding of what it meant to be a man. Amen. And here's the point. Here's where I'm going at with this. And this is scary to me. I promise you it's so scary to me. I feel I could be just real for you. But there is a way that seems right for a man. Amen. There is a way that seemeth right for a man, but the end of that is death. Amen. And I know firsthand what that looks like to feel like I was right, to feel like what I was doing was good and right. Amen. There are things that we feel like are noble in our life, but I could be just as wrong and on my way to hell. Amen. I could be just as wrong because there is a way that seems right to a man. And Brother Herring, you hit me right in the face, I'm telling you, because that was me. That was me. I chased entertainment with everything that I was. I chased live music for with everything that I was. And 10, 12 years later, I'm still fighting those battles. So I thank you for that. Amen. I thank you for that word today because I needed that and nobody else did. Amen.
And in Leviticus chapter 10, Aaron's sons found out that there is a way that seems right to a man. Hey Amen. When they come before the altar and they, they offered up strange fire before a God, they found out that there is a way that seems right into a man. Amen. But that's not it. Because I'm here to tell you that there is a fire that proceeds from God and that is the only fire in this place tonight that matters. Amen. That is the only fire that matters. I can't offer up a strange fire on this altar. Amen. I've got to bring myself to God because there is a fire and he said that that fire should never ever go out. Amen. And if I'm not going to carry that fire, somebody else is going to carry it because his word is not wrong. Amen. Somebody else will carry this. Someone else will carry this for my family, amen. But I can't be guaranteed that what fire they bring to my kids is fire that proceeds from God, amen. But I bet everything in my body of dollar that somebody would bring them strange fire, amen. So I've got to guard my home with everything that I am, amen. Glory, God, I praise you, God. So as I'm about to wrap this up, and I'm going to let the musicians do what they do. But I come to ask you this. How far are you willing to go? I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. How far are you willing to go? Amen. What are you willing to lay on this altar? Amen. What are you willing to give up to pursue Jesus Christ? Amen. Because my Bible tells me to lay aside every weight and sin that would easily beset you. Amen. <laughs> Now, let me say that again because it didn't say just lay aside the sin, amen. It said lay aside the weight, amen. And sometimes there are things that are too big for me to carry, amen. It don't have to be a sin in my life, but when it becomes an idol in my life, I've got to lay that thing down, amen. I've got to be able to come to an altar and lay that weight aside. Because here's the truth. Here's I'm just, because nothing else Let me say that again. Nothing else matters. Amen. The writer of Ecclesiastes do that. He said everything is vanity without God. Amen. Because he understood that without God, if I gain everything, I've gained nothing. Amen. So I ask again, as the musicians are about to sing, what are you willing to give up? I'm going to say right now, I don't care what it is. Before we go into this service, I think we ought to go into every service with a repentant heart. Amen. So if there's something that you need to lay down at this altar as they are playing, I, I open this up and let you do that. Amen. Lay it down and let's get right before God. Amen. As the musicians come. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Before we start this praise and worship service, the children of Israel were told to march around the wall and they were told to, to be silent. I need your help tonight. Will you help me? I don't have a timer, but if we could take about 10 or 15 seconds, I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to think. I want you to remember. I want you to bring to the forefront of your mind every time. It didn't look like it was going to work out, but God. When the enemy had set up encampments about you and you had enemies all around you, I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to think. I want you from the recesses of your mind and the innermost part of your being to think back to a place where there was a pit and there was miry clay and there was a hand that came down. I don't want you to say anything. I just want you, I just want you to think. I just want Be afraid of the silence. Just think. Did you think? Is it in your mind? 
Now you should have no problem when I ask you to magnify the Lord with me and to exalt his name. You should not need any poking. You should not need any prodding. I call these things to remembrance and I have hope. If it had not been for the Lord's mercies, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, let everything that hath breath praise his name. Come on, come on, come on, come on. On the count of three, I want you to proclaim the name of Jesus with everything you've got. One, two, three. What's his name? Let's have church. Let's have church. Let's go to war tonight. Now this song we're about to sing is called the Song of Ascension. We're going up. We're going up. We're going to sing, and I need your help. I need you to repeat after us, okay? Let's shake heaven with our praise tonight.
sing it to him. You're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. You are perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord.
Travel's not the end game, journey's where you are. You never want it perfect, you just want it in my heart. And the story isn't over, just cause the story isn't good. got any prodigals? We got any prodigals in the house? Prodigals come home, the helpless find home. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Come on, let's go. Cynical fun
when the father's in the room, prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life, love is on the move, when the father's in the room, miracles take place, and the cynical find way, love is breaking through, when the father's in the room, Jericho walls are breaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. I say it again. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Lay your burdens down. Ooh, in the Father's house. Pick your strength. Hallelujah. Come on, just a few more seconds longer. It feels good to be in the house. Oh, we're in the Father's house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Blessed is your name. Blessed is your name. Amen. Amen. What a powerful atmosphere that is in this room right now. Amen. If you can, just begin to make your way back to your seats. Because the night's only just beginning. And we have already been in two powerful, been under two powerful words from the Lord today. And um, I've been shaken, stirred slapped but i feel like i'm awoke i'm awake now I feel like i'm woke that's what everybody's saying right now right I feel like i'm woke right now amen amen we just want to give a very heartfelt thank you to to new life church uh, for opening up their facility to us can we just give them a hand clap of appreciation pastor barry sutton and his group. God bless them. Amen. God bless them. He called on the phone a few years ago and just made this uh, available to, uh, to the men's ministry. And he has not asked that, that uh, there be any, any monies given for what they've done. So we are, we're just, we're honored today to be here and uh, thankful what a what a beautiful campus what a beautiful campus obviously the Lord is doing great 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 things here amen also to tonight and we had him this morning but we're honored to have our bishop Bishop Stan Davidson with us our district superintendent he's gonna come up and greet you I want you to put your hands together for God as he comes can you do that come on Bishop Let's praise the Lord. He is awesome. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I give honor to Pastor Sutton and his echo what has been said. Thank you for opening the doors of this beautiful facility. And uh, honor to Brother Sims, our men's ministry director and this awesome team amen i love men's conference and uh, we have several district officials for the roberts is here and uh, we honor him several presbyters i've seen here god bless you and pastors pastors have always been my heroes but boy did you do well in 2020 amen <laughs> our pastors Leadership has been a challenge. 
but God has anointed our leaders. Amen. I've talked with pastors around the state. You know what I have felt like I've never felt before in my life? I've always known it was there, but I have felt a passion to do whatever must be done to connect with the people that God has called us to lead and to pastor. We have some incredible pastors in Alabama. Amen. And I am I'm proud of our pastors. Great, great people of God. Amen. That's right. They deserve the honor that's given them. Amen. And let your pastor know. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I promise you he's got two ears, and I promise you he's been hearing different things in each one of them over the last 12 months. But, you know, the voice that we need to hear more than anything else is the voice of God. Without a sovereign move of the Holy Ghost, there is no hope. But there is hope, as we felt today. God told me, few months ago and I, I called together a Zoom conference of our, our leaders that were responsible for our conferences and there was a unity in our decision that we were going to push forward to see God do some great things in spite of everything that was going around us and, um, and there was just a strong camaraderie there in that, in that session. And God just told me, caution may slow you down, but fear will paralyze you. Amen. You say you have no fear? Oh, yes, I've got fear. I've got fear of not being in the presence of God. I've got fear of not having fellowship with my brothers and sisters. I've got fear of not feeling his glory come into the house. So that's a fear I can do something about because I know that when we come together, he will be there. And so we have launched forth, and I'm telling you, I'm not even going to spend any time talking. Just tell you behind the scenes, there's been a whole lot of work, a lot of scrambling, a lot of figuring out what we're going to do, what we're going to do, if we're going to do it. Last week, I guess close to 550 young people were in Birmingham for a dynamic youth convention that rattled the roof. In a few weeks, the ladies' conference will happen, and all I can tell you is the ladies are powerful, powerful creatures. And I know that uh, I have the privilege of going as district superintendent and I'd get in trouble to tell you to sneak in, but I promise you it'll be great. But here we are, a bunch of men made in the image of God with a sovereign nature, a special endowment of stubbornness created to face obstacles and overcome them created to walk in front of our families, created to lead because we are, to a degree, sovereign creatures, free moral agents. So that's why it is so special when a man surrenders to God. Hell shudders when a man surrenders to God. That's why it's so special when a man prays. Heaven listens when a man prays. And when men praise God, worlds are shaken. Amen. I, I feel such a glory here. Men's conference is always a special time for me because I get to come here and not work very much and just soak it in. 
But I'm going to tell you what, it's been a long time since we've been together, but today, those two messages, Brother Herring, Brother Whitley, if you were not here today, you must get those messages. You must get those messages. They are for now. And God has brought us to a powerful place. I could list you message after message that I've heard at Alabama Men's Conference that has changed my life, changed the men of our church. And many of them have been preached by J.B. Sims. Amen. Always, always want to hear Brother Sims. Amen. Awesome, awesome man of God. He deserves that honor. Amen. So I want to bring you a man that I love and respect, a man that I call friend, a man that I trust, and I know he has a word for the men of Alabama, and the impact his life has had on us is tremendous. And Brother Sims, I know God's got another word for us today. God bless you. Take us to God's throne. That belongs to Jesus. Why don't you call his name? Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, and you can be seated. I have some remarks here at the outset that I need to make before I get into my message, and I, um, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, I also have probably the lengthiest opening scripture text you've ever sat through. So uh, just brace yourself for a few minutes. I'm not very smart, but when we were putting this together, I knew that uh, our district knew the cold lion killer over here from that incredible uh, message that he preached for us last year. So I'm just going to be transparent. So I placed him first because he's a drawing card. I'm sorry. But I also knew that they did not know Brother Whitley. I did. And, in fact, I mentioned to you that Louisiana conference, I only bought one message that year, and it was his. So I knew if you could ever get to hear him that you'd be all right. And then I intentionally put me where I met tonight because all I got to do is bunt. That's all I have to do. And uh, Brother Herring's going to help us, and then tomorrow, and then Brother Whitley's going to send us home with the word that will burn all the way back to your front door and in your house. And So without further ado, let me start. I typed these remarks down because I didn't want to miss anything. Greetings, great men of Alabama. What a ride. I stand before you tonight in humility and gratitude for the years that I've been allowed this great honor of serving you men. You are great men. Don't allow anyone to tell you any different. You are making a difference in your local church because you've put your hands and your heart into the harvest, into the field. It's been my great honor to serve you, to help you, and to even serve as your leader for a short part of that journey. We waded through the ankle-deep mud 
and built our first church in a day in Greenville, Alabama. We helped the people of Waveland, Mississippi, recover after Hurricane Katrina, and we helped rebuild that entire church. We made seven or eight trips to Tupelo, Mississippi, to help make a difference in other people's dreams. We made eight trips to Guatemala starting in 2013 and finishing in 2015. The total number of around 100 airline tickets bought from you men and $75,000 cash to build a little house in that compound called the Alabama House. We were able to build our second, this is going to sound like a paradox, church in a day that took three months in Phoenix City. We joined with men from Louisiana and California to build not one but two churches in Uruguay, a nation stooped in witchcraft and black magic. We were honored to go to Peru in 2008 after the earthquakes and help a little people. I, I don't mean that in a, just, just a, a great, uh, simple folks with dirt on the floor, but I'll tell you something, what a group of praying people in a church. We started a project in Haiti called the Hope Hill Project, and two days before our second trip, a travel ban was put in place because of this horrible thing called COVID. The project has continued because of the Haitian brethren, and we have not been able to return to finish, and only God knows when we can. This doesn't include the many, many man hours of labor that you helped in what we affectionately called back then work week in Alabama on the campground. Don't allow anyone to tell you that you haven't made a difference in the lives of people around the world. Aside from the honor of serving the men and women of FTC in Foley, Alabama, the second highest honor of my ministry has been to serve you men. I want to thank the men of the district board for allowing me to serve with such great latitude. I especially thank those that were serving way back when you placed your confidence in me to serve in this capacity. My memory doesn't work as it once did, but I'm going to take a shot at it. Brother Lewis was a superintendent. Brother Botterford was the secretary. Our current bishop was the presbyter of Section 4, Brother Kraft was the presbyter of Section 2. Brother Twyman was the presbyter of Section 6. Mike Harrell had Section 8. Brother Cordova had Section 1. Brother Shearer had 7. Brother Egan had 5. And Brother Rick Vesperman had 3. And if I overlooked or misstated any, please forgive me. It's been my honor to work alongside the great district leaders in the mission of serving the kingdom. I was honored to serve alongside two great men in this ministry, Brother Steve Brasita and Brother James Bice, that are here. I know where Brother Brasita is. I wish you'd give them a hand. I also would like to thank Kenneth Rogers for putting up with me all this time and making sure that you get the messages you want. And then all of our section men leaders are great men, and I appreciate the hard work that they do to extort funds from you for Father's Day offering. I want to thank Ian Overstreet for being the greatest music director that I know. And with the help of Terrence J. Walton and Brother Gideon and all of these other fine men, we have enjoyed the best 
real men, music team in all of the UPC. I want to thank my son, Pastor Jason Sims, for all the faithful behind-the-scenes work that he's done to help me all these years. I want to thank the great men that allow me to serve them as pastor at FTC and Foley without their support, without their prayers and blessings, without their help. None of these things I mentioned above would have been possible. I would like to especially honor my great friend, my closest friend, Tim Overstreet, for his help these last 22 years since I've been in this district. Every year, these men paid their way to come and work conference. Let's let that sink in. To make sure that our frontline conference was the best that we could make it. Every mission, every project, all the things we've been allowed to do did not come without struggles, without their, their measures of stress, without the bitterness of some type of failure because nothing that mankind puts their hands to is without flaw. I'm sure they will most likely not hear this message but it's been such a great honor to serve under the leadership of Reverend Mike Williams and Reverend Jerry Dean, two of my very dear friends, anointed men and genuine Christian men. I'd like to thank Bishop Stan Davidson for allowing me the honor for allowing me the honor of speaking at such a great, great conference and allowing me to share this final message with you men. I appreciate the work he is doing and all the leaders of our district that work together to make Alabama the greatest district that it is. Amen. I am thankful for the pastors that are here and the men that have given me second and third and fourth chances. I'm truly grateful. Lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank my bride of 42 years, Joanne Sims, who I hope is watching right now. It, I could use the points. Who is without doubt the greatest woman I know. And if you think I've been able to accomplish even the slightest bit of success, it is because of Almighty God, her and my children, Jason and Janika, Andrea and Ian, and of course my 11 grandchildren, of whom two of my grandsons are here, and I have one great grandson. Every man needs to know when it's time to let someone else take it to another level. That time has come for me. I leave knowing I've received more than I've given. For God to bring men like you all into my life, I will forever be grateful. I have made friendships that will be lifelong. It's been a great ride. I love you. God bless you. Can somebody give a hand clap to Jesus so that I can get a relief from this awkward moment? And you can be seated now in a little while, not, not while I'm preaching, but later on. You're going to get to witness. If you've never seen the dead be resurrected, you're going to see it because my friend, Brother Josh Herring, is going to come up here after I'm through and he's going to resurrect what I kill. <laughs> you're leaving. And now for my extremely lengthy text, please, please.
please forbear, and I ask the great men that I'm honored to serve to please forgive me. For I'm about to preach a message that I just recently preached at home, but I do feel strongly that I am preaching a message that I need to be tonight, but it is somewhat awkward. But I am sandwiched between two giants. And this is what you get when you squeeze me, so... Genesis chapter number 23, I would like to read the whole entire chapter. And so for that cause, if it doesn't bother you, I'd like for you just to stay seated if I don't offend anybody. If I do, then you stand. I'm just giving you warning that I'm going to do a lot of reading because I'm going to read the, the entire chapter. And then I'm going to the book of Exodus. <sighs> By then I'll be tired because I'm a fat man, but I'm going to catch my second wind. Amen. Moses is the writer of both of these episodes and incidences that I will be reading tonight. And Moses is one of the greatest artists in the Bible. He can paint such a magnificent picture. I'd like for you to see the picture that he is painting in this text that I read for you tonight. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up before his dad, dead, and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field for as much money as it is worth. He shall give it me for a possession of a burying place against you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham and the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me, the field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land and spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I will pay thee. Hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, that I may bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Ephron weighed the uh, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave that was therein and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, but for all that went in at the gate of the city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre. 
the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. You don't need a deep breath, but I do. So I'll take a deep breath as you turn to the book of Exodus. And I appreciate your patience with me tonight. Now we turn to another picture that Moses is painting. And it goes like this. In verse 8, Exodus 36. Every wise-hearted man among you that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet. With cherubims of cunning work made he them. The length of one curtain was twenty cubits and eight cubits. And the breadth of one curtain was four cubits. The curtains were of all one size. And he coupled the five curtains unto one another. And the other five curtains he coupled one to another. And he made loops of blue on the edge of one of the of one curtain from the selvage in the coupling likewise he made the uttermost side of another curtain in the coupling of the second 50 loops made he in one curtain and 50 loops made he in the edge of the curtain which was in the coupling of the second the loops held one curtain to another and he made 50 thatches of gold and coupled the curtains one to another with the thatches so it became one tabernacle and so we have two incredible pictures. One of them I can see clear, but the other, and I have to tell you, I can't. I get lost on the curtains and the thatches and the selvage and all that kind of stuff. The 23rd chapter of Genesis paints an extremely beautiful picture. With the exception of the thought that it deals almost entirely with death something that we don't like to uh, mess around with very much. The process of living, thank you, sir. The process of living is sometimes beautiful, but the process after death is not beautiful at all. Moses was the painter of both of these, but one I can understand perfectly. The other takes a good bit of studying. I would point out to you, though, in verse 9 of Genesis 23, we read that Abraham said that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money for a burying place. So we see the picture, and we see the field, and we see that the cave is at the end of the field. Then we see in verse 17 that the description is even more clear. Because in 2317, he says, And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure. So now we see our painting, and it's even more clear. So my very simple message tonight, and the title of my message is The Feel, The Trees, and The Cave at the End. The Feel, The Trees, and The Cave at the End. Now, Lord, I lift up my voice to you, and I ask you to help. I know because you have already shown me that you're going to bust the hardness off of some hearts you're going to break the shackles off of some hands and some feet, and you're going to loose the tongues of some incredibly powerful men in this place. I'm asking for your anointing to flow. Let it pick up exactly where it left off this morning with Pastor Whitley and let it continue on throughout all of these messages. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. So what is the point of all of this? Abraham was promised this land from God, but he never owned a single inch or parcel of ground with the exception of this field and the trees and the cave that is in the end, and he had to purchase that. This means no matter what we may purchase and possess, just humor me. 
there's always going to be a cave at the end of the field. No matter, every person, great or small, rich or poor, famous or unknown, must always purchase a field, the trees, and the cave at the end. When life begins, I like to see it this way, that we stand at the edge of a new field as a newborn. We stand at the edge of the new field. We look around and we see the trees and we see the borders and we see the trees that were over on the border that Abraham mentioned. And we look close. For some it's a great way. For some it's not. My first daughter, it was only 169 days. But there's always a cave at the end of the field. It's a sad fact of life, my brothers. But one day, one day we're going to take our loved ones that are so beautiful in our sight and we're going to put them out of our sight in a grave. Death changes the way you look. And I'm happy to tell you, you won't be able to do anything about it. In the here and now, you can paint, trim, cover, color, control, do everything that you can, tummy tuck and all the other things to change the way that you look. But when you face death, you will not be able to do anything about it. Life screams, hold on to me. But death screams, put me away. No one, absolutely no one will have to tell you to put away your dead loved one. You will do it willingly. You will hold the memory, but you will bury the body. The body that you hugged, kissed, caressed, whispered to, you will place in a grave one day because there is always a cave at the end of the field. Oh, it's not an act of anger or hatred that you put them in the cave, but an act of love. It's somewhat strange that while they were here walking in our field among the trees, we remember well all the times they said a harsh word to us. We remember the fighting and the arguments. We remember the hurtful names they called us when they were walking in our field. We remember when they cut their eyes over at us and the things they said that really hurt. But when they reached the cave, It's like our mind goes blank and we want to put every harsh word, every snarling remark and every crooked look in the cave with them. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that while they're here walking among the field and looking at the trees and living day to day and helping us and supporting us? Wouldn't it be nice if we could forever keep in our mind that no matter how long our field is and no matter how grand and glorious the trees are in our field, there's always a cave at the end of the field. So for about the next 15 minutes, I want to ask you, what are you doing in your field? One of my favorite men in the Bible was a man by the name of Shammah. And the Bible says that one day the children, the men, I'll say the men of Israel, got a chicken in their heart. Or perhaps they were just saying, it's not my field. And the scripture says that they turned tail, tucked and run. Something that my daddy would have beat me senseless for. Because he used to point that big banana finger at me and say, Boy, if I ever hear you run, 
you don't want to come home. And I reckon that's what puts something on the inside of me. I'm not a smart man. I'm not a strong man. But the devil can't stop me. Because I just keep getting up and just keep moving and just keep walking. I may stumble and I may limp a little bit, but I'm not going to stop. And that day, at first he didn't realize it because he was so focused on the enemy and where they were standing because they were in his field. Because the Philistines were, a, were an aggravating, horrible, tormenting group of warriors that were the nemesis of Israel for years and years and years. And they would sit on their lazy carcass back in the five cities of the Philistines. And then when the crops had been planted and the crops had been hoed, And it was time to eat snap beans. And then they would put their swords on their side and they would come rob the crops. But on that day, a man by the name of Shammah, I'm just going to have to speculate because surely it must have been his field. And the shuffling of feet and the fleeing and the squealing of the little girl soldiers that run off and left him did not detour him. He may have been standing in a field of beans, but he knew what was behind the beans because after the beans was the watermelons and after the watermelons was the corn and after the corn was the well and after the well was the house and after the house was mama and after mama was the babies and he said, not today. Not on my field. And I'm happy to report to you that he didn't have to go to the cave that day. But a bunch of Philistines did. Somebody give some praise to Jesus. I come to ask you, what are you doing in your field? A guy by the name of Cain, you can be seated, thank you. A guy by the name of Cain went up to his brother one day and he said, Abe, come take a walk with me in my field. I want to show you something. So he throwed his arm over the shoulder of his brother he said, I've got some pretty squash out here I've planted. I'm just extrapolating. You understand that is not in the Scripture. But they took a walk in the field. And then he stopped for a second. But Abel kept moving. And he, and he, and he reached down and he found that big rock. And he caved his brother's skull in. And he killed him in his field. The only man left alive on the face of the earth that could really show him how to worship God. And he killed him because he wanted to silence that man that indicted him. He didn't say anything, but it reminded him of his failures. So instead of doing something more profitable with his field, like shepherding a few sheep, he decided to kill him and bury him in his field. I want to know, what are you doing in your field? Can I turn your attention to Genesis 3 and 1? And can I remind you that in every field is a serpent. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And you know the rest of it. But it really 
was it that filled? They got Eve. It was the tree that was in the field. The field, the tree, and the cave that was in the end of the field. We read in Genesis 24, 63, that Isaac went out in the field to meditate while he was waiting anxiously for that servant to get back home with that bride. And if I can just stretch it just a little bit, I think I know what I would do, especially if I had a $50 bill. I would slip it in his pocket and say, whatever you do, make sure she ain't ugly. So he's out in the field meditating. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. I, I, I eavesdrop on his prayers. Oh, God. Whew, I can't wait to see her. He's trying to pray. He's, he's distracted just a little bit. He ain't been on no 21-day fast. He's distracted just a little bit, but he's out in the middle of his field, and sure enough, here come the ten Campbells with the servant of Abraham and the girl, and she says, who's that over there in the field? He says, that's your bow. I want to know what are you doing in your field. I want to know what are you doing in your field. Mm. I've had some great, some grand, and some amazing things happen in my field and among the trees, the ones I didn't cut down and build a church out of and build a house out of. Genesis 27 and 1. Two and three, and it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and he said to him, mm, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow. And go out to the field and take me some venison. Go out into the field and take me some venison. Isaac said, I'm old and I don't know when I might die. For a fact, at this point in his life, he is 137 years old. I might think about dying if I'm 137 years old. But for a fact, he lived another 43 years. And the only thing that I can find in the Scripture that I think would cause him to think he's about to die 43 years before he does is because his half-brother Ishmael died at 137 years. And he thought, surely if my brother died at 137, it must be close. So I propose to you tonight that the great man Isaac, he just went ahead and skipped a lot of the last portion of the field and he walked on up to the cave and he pitched his tent outside of the cave and said I'll just wait here because surely any day I will die the power of an unspoken thought let me tell you something. Don't pay no attention to what happened to your brother. Don't pay no attention to when your daddy died. Don't pay no attention to what your uncle had. I'm going to live until I die. Then you can put me in the cave.
Isaac missed a lot of living because he hurried his way through. When Jacob came in with his food to deceit in 27, 27 of Genesis, it says he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his raiment. He blessed him. And he said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field, which the Lord had blessed. You better not let the fool, the field fool you. Don't let the, don't let the field fool you. Don't let the smell of the field fool you. We've entered into, if you don't think the boat has left the dock, you ain't living. Because the boat has already left the dock. And hell is making plans tonight to meet you in your field. And to have its way with you. Because there's a serpent in every field. So you better not let the field fool you. It was hairy hands and the smell of the field that fooled the son of Abraham, the promised child. So don't tell me that because you pastored 23 years that you won't be fooled by the smell of the field and a few hairy hands. Don't tell me because you've been married 40 years that that smooth voice whispering to you on the other You better watch out what gets in your field. Brother Sutton, I'm honored to stand behind your pulpit. I'm skipping some stuff, so whoever you are and wherever you are, just keep up with me. I find it interesting that the field is recorded eight times in Genesis 23 and eight times in the short four-chapter book of Ruth. But in Ruth 4, 5, it says, Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth. The Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Men, you're going to have to buy the field. You want to you wanna get hooked up to the bride? Then you better buy the field. You better quit worrying about who's going to get credit and whose name it goes to. But you better shell it out and you better buy the field. Because your destiny depends on the field. Psalm 96 and 12 says, let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice because I tell you, when you're doing what you're supposed to in your field, that doesn't mean everything will go right. That doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth sailing. That doesn't mean that you're not going to run into a few, a few smooth bumps along the way and you wonder, how did they get in my field? But when you're doing right and you're lining up and ain't nobody else wanting to sing your praise and they're nowhere to be found, God's got some feet. He's got some trees in the field that'll just rejoice right along with you if you'll just listen to what the Spirit is saying. You may not get a call the moment you want that call. You know, all of us preachers know about it. Oh, God, let somebody call me today. Let us speak a word over me and send me a $50,000 check. I'm 
almost done. I'm giving you a warning. You know CPR? You're going to have to. <laughs> the wise man Solomon said, I went by the field of a lazy man in Proverbs 20 and 30. He said, I went by the field of a slothful bump and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding, and it was a mess. And then he said over in 31, he said, you know that virtuous woman? In 16, she considered the field and buy it with the fruit of her hands and planted a vineyard. They both had a field. They both had a field. But look at his and look at hers. Look at his and look at hers. What are you doing with your field? What are you doing with your field? Matthew 13, 44, Almighty God will let you buy another field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth him for joy. Thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth the field. Preach so hard, I'm making other people thirsty. <laughs> hey, I figure it's my last shot. Just give me a chance here. Is, are you the gentleman I'm looking at that's got my stuff? Right up here? You got my picture? Uh, my tractor? I, I need my tractor. Preachers like me have to have all the help we can get. I didn't go to Bible school. I went to learn how to wire houses and buildings and stuff. I didn't learn. Ain't nobody taught me how to build a sermon, so I just have to do the best I can. I was helping a, a group of folks in McCullough, Alabama, a while back, and every, every, every time I was going to service, I'd pass this field there, right at the Creek Nation, the, the, the Ports Creek Nation, there off of exit uh, 53. Brother Vecita, you probably, you probably know whose tractor that was. And, and I can see two good things about it. The first one being obvious, it's a Ford. Oh, hallelujah. That's for my buddy back there. And, uh, I, you know, I'd drive by there, and I'd drive by there, and I'd drive by there. And I mentioned it to him one day there at the church. I said, I sure wish I had a picture of that tractor because, you know, things, weird things talk to me. Because, I, I mean, I'd just drive by, and I'd look, and I'd see all the weeds all overgrown. And I'd go, it's not like a Ford to die. I'm trying to pray through one of the guys in Foley. Y'all just deal with me, okay? He drove up here on a, on a Dodge, and he prayed all the way that he wouldn't break down. <laughs> I've split the house. And, and, and then it hit me one day. I said, that's my selfie. <laughs> That's my selfie. Because that's going to be me. I'm going to be out there in my old field. And I'm going to go, come on, baby. Come on, you got this. Just keep on going. Just keep on going. We're going to play. There's another row in us. We're going to keep on. Pop, 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 pop. There's another row in us, baby. Come on. We're not through with our field. Pop, 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 pop. Pop, 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 pop. And, and, and somebody propped it up. And somebody pushed it along. And I said to myself, no matter what happens, just let me die in the field. Don't let me die on the shop. Don't let me die on the jack. For God's sake, don't put me in the showroom. I was not built for the showroom.
I was built to hit them stumps in the garden, in the ground and go, Ugh. I talked to my tractor. I got two of them. I got a Kubota and I got a, a John Deere back home. I go, go. Come on, baby. We got this. We got home. Oh, we got this. Sit down. I thought you was going to die in the field. And what are you giving up men's ministry for? I didn't say I was giving up living. I just got to go back to Foley and do some stuff. I'm a good maintenance man. I got a long way to go. All the used people can come. Matthew 27, 6 and 7. That was on my last slide. It's on my last slide. I apologize that you probably can't see that good. Well, you probably can. That's a whole lot better. Matthew 26, 27, 6 and 7. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It's not lawful for to put them in the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel. They didn't want to lose the money. But they didn't know what to do. And finally, some guy spoke up and said, hey, why don't we buy the potter's field? And we can bury strangers there. People will tell you that Jesus was a potter, but he wasn't. He was a carpenter. Just because he sent that dude to the potter's house don't mean he was no potter. He was a carpenter. There wasn't no such thing as a carpenter's field because wood was too precious. There wasn't no carpenter's field. You kept every little piece. There was no such thing as a carpenter's field. It was a potter's field. potter's field because when he's working on that and it don't work and it breaks and it's all messed up he just throws it out in a heap and then the next thing you know he's got a, a few other potters in town because they was potters in every town that come and say listen uh, John I, I see you've uh, I see you've you've, uh, you've kind of you, you started making a dump out of your field and uh, I, I was just wondering you reckon it'd be all right if I dumped my stuff in your field, too? Because, I mean, your field's a field, and, and, and I, I got broke pottery. I got messed up pieces, and, and since you've, that's what you've decided to do with your field, you don't need your field. You're a potter. You just, you, so it'd be all right with you if I dump my stuff in your field. And then the next thing you know, he's got broken pieces of pottery. Them dudes done one thing right with the silver. They bought the field. You think it was with 20 pieces of silver? No. It was the blood of a carpenter that bought the potter's field. It was the blood of a carpenter. And so this person and that person is dumped garbage in your field and they've helped you mess it up. This one's come along and dumped stuff on you and that one's come along and dumped stuff on you and you look around and you're looking at your field and your field is a mess. 
I know a carpenter that shed his blood to buy a field that you could be buried in that would change your life. They're going to sing. You pray, you run, you jump, you do whatever you want to do. I'm through. Turn. 
said he preached that in Foley, but um, that's not how I remember it. That was a brand new one on me. That was the same title, but the Lord took that and steered that and wove that around, and uh, that was just an incredible word for me. I know it was for you. Why don't we just give God some praise for that right there? Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for what you're doing in this conference. Lord, you're changing lives. You're changing hearts. Oh, God! Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you begin to make your way back to your seat? Because we still have one more speaker before this night is over. And I am really looking forward to what the Lord is going to speak yet again through evangelist Josh Herring. What an incredibly powerful word we heard this morning on the intoxication of entertainment powerful. I'm going to take that with me. It's going to stick. I want my good friend to come right now. He's going to preach to you the unadulterated, undiluted, powerful Word of God, and I'm thankful that he is here. We're blessed in this house in Jesus' name. Put your hands together one more time. Why don't we lift our voice and magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this house right now. Let some men lift up their voice and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. We're tired, but we're warriors. Amen. What an incredible message from Brother Sims. Would you clap your hands and thank the Lord for the word of the Lord we heard tonight. will not hold you long, I know. I'm standing in between you and food. And that's never a good place for a preacher to be. But we'll, you got a little bit left in you? Or? Yeah. 
give honor to Bishop Davidson again. Thank you again for having me. And, and uh, Brother Sims, you too, for all the hard work you've done. I hope you appreciate all the years and the wonderful legacy this man is leaving you. That's some big shoes to fill for who's ever. Let me again give honor to Pastor Whitley. If you didn't hear his message today on uh, the second Martha. I don't think I want to preach anymore. After hearing them sing, I know I'm not singing anymore. So I'm pretty much leaving here with no self-esteem. It's wonderful. Glad to have Jet the Threat with me here. I love you, buddy. He's five. I'm doing my best to do double duty here. I'm trying to stay focused on church and focused on him. But I definitely want to take you where the Lord has told me to go tonight. Acts 28, 1 through 5, and Revelation 20, verse 10. All the pastors here, I give you honor. Uh, Pastor Sutton, this beautiful facility for having this here tonight, this weekend, give you honor. Acts 28, 1 through 5, very popular text. We won't be going in the deep end, but we're going to have fun. And then Revelation 20, verse 10. When they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. The barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire, received us every one because of the present rain, because of the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom though he hath escaped the sea yet vengeance suffereth not to live and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm revelation 20 verse 10 is the devil's favorite verse the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever I want to read that again just so he can hear it. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That day's coming, sweetheart. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day, night, forever and ever. I want to preach to you for a few minutes tonight from the subject, burn the snake. Burn the snake. Why don't we just worship the Lord one more time and clap our hands to the Lord. And David said, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. There's nothing more powerful than men clapping and shouting. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. It's funny how we blame the devil for everything car breaks down Satan himself visited your house and made that car break down let me just say this if the devil is always attacking you you're in the top 10 in the world because the devil himself only attacked seven people in the entire Bible that'd be Judas or Jesus Judas Moses he wanted his dead body went after David he, Peter as he preached about today and wanted to sift him as wheat and Ananias and Sapphira Satan bound them and a couple more. He, seven or eight people he just attacked. So if the devil's always coming after you, you are in the top ten. And we honor you for coming to the men's conference. <laughs> we don't deserve to be in your presence. But I will tell you that there is this specific demonic strategy that I see all the time, and that is when life happens and we blame, thank you, man, we, I'm going to need that, <laughs> and we blame the devil it seems like that's his pathway in, and the only way I can describe it is hell likes to dogpile when things get bad. When they see the child of God vulnerable or weak or tired or afflicted, and life is bringing them and storms are coming at them, it seems that that's when they attack the child of God, the demonic spirits. They, they recognize when you're weary and when you're tired, and so... It's not a surprise that snakes follow storms. And when you're trying to survive something that you never 
thought you'd have to go through. And Paul is in this ship, and they're in a massive storm. And it's not because of him. It's because of somebody else. Have you ever had to survive somebody else's storm? It's powerful to survive your own storm. It's another thing when the family member is causing a storm in your life and you have to constantly pray just to stay saved because they're trying to drag you out of the Holy Ghost all the time. Y'all don't have that family member? You might be the family member. <laughs> uh, and, and it's storm after storm. I don't know if you go, if you live in the ministry at all, it's storm after storm. You survive. And sometimes victory is just surviving. I'd love to shout, but sometimes I'm just thankful to be here because there's been so many things that come against us that we're, whew, and the boat fell apart and they swam to the island and they, some got on broken boards of the ship and they just survived. And the Bible said it started raining. Ever thought a storm was over? Well, I'm glad that's over. Then you get another call. Yeah, just trying to make it. Paul's exhausted. He's a prisoner. He's worn out. He worked on the boat, and now he's survived a shipwreck, and it's raining, and he's cold. And he's tired, and he's vulnerable, and he's weary, and he's exhausted, and it's then that hell attacks. I learned something in the Bible that, that I think is interesting, that uh, the, the difference between a storm and a snake the storms always attack multiple people. The snakes always come at individuals. Well, what about the fire serpents in the, in the Old Testament? Yeah, read that word, fire serpents. It's seraphims or angels that God caused to bite everybody. But in the Bible, when there were storms, it was multiple people involved. Even Jonah's storm, the, the mariners on the boat had to go through it. The disciples were in this. Every time there was a storm, Noah and his family in the ark, there was multiple people involved. If your family's under attack, it's a storm. If it's coming at you and nobody knows about it, it's a snake. Mm. And the viper in the fire, near the heat of the fire, sees Paul coming. And Paul is cold and he's tired and he's soaking wet. But there's something about Paul that even though he's exhausted like Brother Sims just preached, he can't stop working for God. He just can't stop. So he, he sees a little fire. Someone's trying to help him. And so he tries to help them help him. I like people that don't make me work to help them get out of their trouble. There are people that never want to, they try to prove a point in the atmosphere, but there are the people that when you reach a hand toward them to help them, they want up from the dilemma. So they say, help me. I love helping those types of people. And Paul said, if there's a fire, I'm going to make it hotter. I'm going to raise the blaze. And so he picks up some sticks and he begins to, so now he's not just cold and tired and exhausted. Now he's under a heavy load. And he goes to the fire and and whew, just want to get this thing better than what it is, hotter than what it is. I, I'm never, I, we should never be satisfied with, with powerful church. It's been amazing, and it's been, it's been wonderful, but we should always be trying to go to the next level where I'm not satisfied with this morning's breakthrough, and it was powerful after Pastor Wheatley spoke, but I, I, I want to I go to the next level. How can we make this thing hotter? Someone needs to get healed in here tonight. That's how. Someone, someone needs to be, get off drugs in here tonight. Someone needs a miracle from God. We can go to another level if we want to. We can step into demonstration. We can step into where the power of God enters your pew and you're healed. Yeah, we can. And Paul said, I'm going I'm to raise this blaze. And, 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 and so he's, his mission isn't helping. His condition isn't helping. It's just a setup for an attack. You're surviving storms and you're trying to make the fire hotter. The devil's going to hate your guts. You're going through hell, but yet you're still worshiping. The devil's going to. If you're going through hell and pouting, the devil's going to leave you alone. Don't worry. But if you're going through crazy stuff and, they, and you drag yourself in here, but you're going to get that hand up somehow before the night's over and say, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. You're going to be hated. 
I'd rather be hated by hell than loved by humans. There's something powerful about knowing I'm doing what's right and then the will of God. Yeah. And the snake fastened on his hand. His hands were about to be used to heal everybody on the island. The devil always attacks the area that God's about to use. Pray for my finances. You all shout about your finances. Well, I'm paying my tithes. And the devil's just taking. I rebuke the devourer in the name of the Lord Jesus. As Brother Hernandez used to say, if you're in attack by the devil, all you have to do is start giving. And when you give, the Bible says God will rebuke the devourer. You don't have to cast the devil out. Just start giving and paying your tithes and sacrificing, and God will take us. Oh, God will take care of that spirit that's trying to get at your kids. I know we're not all shouting about that, but the tithers know what I'm talking about. There's something that enters the atmosphere. You can give your way out of a storm. Fastened on his hand, and the viper, one of the most venomous snakes in the world, latches on to Paul's hand, the venom. And it's the snake's desire to kill you from the inside out. I'm going to fill him with bitterness. I'm going to fill him with anger or pride. Everyone's going to shout and clap their hands but him. Everyone's going to worship but him. He's full of pride. Get the venom in him. Get the bitterness in him. Get the lust in him. Get the fear in him. Get the depression. Get the anxiety. Get the anger. Get the racism in him. Whatever I've got to get in him to kill him from the inside out. Powerful on the outside, but dying on the inside because there's a snake attached. Hmm. Some people love everybody in church, hate preachers. Just so I know, you know, I know you're here. It's venom. You got a snake attached to you. And it's funny how, Pastor Whitley, when the snake bites, the people start talking bad about him. Because it's the snake's desire not to just fill you with venom, but to get others to prophesy your demise. He ain't going to survive that. He's not coming through that. Now, people are piling on. Bad enough, you're under attack, and there's something constantly reminding you of things to get angry about and bitter about. And every time you speak, it's negative words. And, but now you hear people talking about you. And Paul's going to die. Oh, he's, he deserves this. See, he used to kill people. And so this is just vengeance. Uh, uh, see, that's a, that thing that's attacked, if God really loved him, he wouldn't have any attacks. If God really loved him, there wouldn't be a snake attached to him. As if God doesn't let you go through anything to prove his love. He proves his love by letting you go through the thing and surviving when you should be dead, when you should be in a psych ward, when you should be hung over, when you should be on a bar stool, but you came out of the storm somehow. I know it's shallow, but if it had not been for the Lord, I know we patty cake that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And I know we just go through the motions that no weapon formed against us is able to prosper. But if it had not been for God, nobody in the building would be in their pew, would be standing or sitting. It was mercy. It was grace. It was love. Just survived a storm only to be bitten by a snake, only to be spoken about by my people. 
What's harder to survive, the snake or the brother? I know some brothers that are snakes. <laughs> Posing as friends. I'll get away from that because I don't want to mess with you. <laughs> You're trying to do your best and God's letting him attack you. And so you got a storm you're just coming out of, a snake trying to kill you now, and people talking about you. Sounds like good times. Might be worse than COVID. Just saying. If you look at the snake and you, look and you hear the people, it's pretty easy to get discouraged. But I want to give you some stuff heaven wants you to know about this. First of all, in the Bible, storms never killed a child of God. I can put the mic down on that right there. Storms never killed the child. If you're in a storm, you ought to thank God. You must be surviving. You're not going to get, you're not going to die in this. Your family's going to be all right. Oh, I know we're not going to go crazy about that, but somebody needs that word right now because the devil's saying, I'm going to destroy your marriage. I'm going to take your kid. You must be lying to me. I'm in a storm. I'm going to survive it. Number two, the snake that's attacking you, that's trying to kill you, had to crawl to the encounter with you. Oh, they didn't get it. The thing you think is going to take you out didn't come walking in here with you. It's underneath your feet right now. The demon that's prophesying your death had to crawl just to have an encounter with you. Do you realize who you are? Do you realize the king you serve? Get off the ground and get up and be the man of God that he anointed you to be. <laughs> Somebody put him under your feet right now. He had to crawl. He had to crawl to meet you. <laughs> you might be cold, but at least you're not crawling. You might be weak, but you're not crawling. I might be discouraged, but I walked in here. If you can't move, they'll wheel me, but I'm not crawling in here. That's the devil's job to crawl to the child of God. Some of y'all don't believe it because you think this, this giant demon is just attacking you and pushing you. Down. He's not bigger than you are. Like old Jeff Arnold used to say, if that legion, if legions are 2 million, or 2,000, excuse me, to 6,000, and that's what a legion is, say it's only 2,000, and there's 2,000 devils in that one man, how small is a devil? That it, one man could hold 2,000 of them inside of him. Would you stop magnifying Satan? Well, I would, but the devil, if he attacks you with every spirit in hell, you have a God that is greater than anything Satan can bring against you. They saw the venomous beast holding on to his hand. You ready for number three? What you call an attack, God calls hell barely holding on. <laughs> what you call an all-out attack on you is the devil saying, I hope he doesn't get out of that pew tonight. 
I hope he, I hope he don't bust a move toward the altar. I've done everything I can do uh, to keep him locked down with anger and frustration and distraction. But if he decides on the spur of a moment to get free, there's nothing I can do. I'm barely holding on to him. Somebody ought to remember, God is on your side. God is on your side. Go ahead and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not the knee. Oh, the devil's got me. Oh, the devil's got us. Oh, I'm so scared what's going to happen. We're about to get raptured. That's what's going to happen. Hope you come with us. They might not let us do this. Do you know right now, I'm going to talk about tomorrow, but the state of Wisconsin, we are planning, I'm not even from them, we're planning a crusade on May 23rd where all 80 churches are coming or going to do it live in their church and there's one massive event and thousands of people are already coming. Oh, but we're just, the, devil's, the devil doesn't have us. Revival is about to unleash on this nation. We're about to see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost that this nation has ever seen. The attack is a signal that revival is about to hit the land. Come on, pastor, stop preaching that we're barely holding on. We're not barely holding on. We are the church triumphant. We're going to have greater things than we've ever seen. We're going to have the revival that's been prophesied. Satoru Shakata. And we all know the fun part. You can't shake the snake in the fire if you won't shake yourself. <laughs> you can't get rid of the attack when you want to be a statue in church. I can try to help you all night long, but if you refuse to budge, God's not going to deliver you. But the second you decide to move, all hell says watch out. We can't stop the praisers. We can't stop the worshipers. We can't stop the warriors. When they decide to get free, all they have to do is get one hand loose. And if one hand gets loose, That's why the quickest way to get the devil off your back is to get your hands in the air. Because when your hands go up, the snakes go out. When your hands go up, something happens in the atmosphere. <laughs> oh, son of my soul. Yeah. Wish the devil would leave me alone, but why don't you snap out of it and he will? Why don't you just, just kindly shove your brother beside you and say, snap out of it? <laughs> snap out of it. Snap out of it. You know, you get that friend that's like, did you see what happened in the news today? No. Did you hear what God said in prayer today? No? Oh, okay. When you hear what God says in the prayer closet, I'll listen to your news story. 
I don't serve this kingdom. You know how to kill a snake? I thought, you know, well, Paul was excellent at killing people. Maybe he could stone the snake. Maybe he'd cut his head off. Paul just said, if I shake myself, the fire will get him. Here's what the, I had a young man tell me, Stacey, we're done. I had a young man tell me, Brother Harry, the devil's attacking my marriage, and he's been saying all this stuff to me and my wife, and attacking my parents, my dad's sick, and all these things are going wrong. And I thought he was going to tell me, you know, like, please pray for me. Please help me. You know, I can't take much more. But then he said the most amazing thing. He said, and I just thought about something. I said, what's that? He said, I can try to fight him with all the things he's saying, or I can just let him burn. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he keeps reminding me of my past, so I'm going to remind him of his future. Let him burn. He can say what he wants to say, but there's a cave coming to him. It's the lake of fire, and he's never going to get out of it. Stop trying to defend yourself. You can never win an argument with Lucifer. But if you would just shake yourself, you'll remember where he's going. Jack, come here, baby. Come here, baby. I'm sorry if he bothered some of y'all today moving around. He's five. I have four kids. He's my second oldest. When he was three, a demon came to him. We didn't know what it was. He just started talking to something. We didn't thought it was just something imaginary until he started telling us that his favorite number was 666. And, and he started having all these conversations and evil things were attacking. We had no idea where it was from. For a year. Have a wild church and go home to... Stuff coming and saying and words. And where where'd that come from, buddy? Where'd you hear that? I, he named the demon. His name was Ungo. He said, Ungo told me to say that to you, Dad. So after about a year, Bishop, we were preaching at Brother John's in Atlanta. And it was getting worse and worse. And so I just I had Brother John's pray for him. And, and a couple of days later, he said, Daddy, that, that Ungo's leaving. I said, okay. Where'd he go? He just left. I said, okay. Never came back. Well, about a week ago, he said he came in my room. He was crying. He said, Dad, what's the matter, buddy? He said, this uh, snake came to me in my dream. He kept turning into a man, back into a snake. He said he kept, his, his eyes were red. He said he kept chasing me and telling me he was going to get me. It's okay, buddy. It's okay. Took him to our pastor, Brother Kinsey. And it, he prayed for him and covered him and stopped the attack. And then this is what my little boy said. He said, Dad. I said, yeah. He said, I'm okay. He said, I stared that devil down. I stared him down said, you're not going to get me. He's five. So pardon me if at men's conference he's moving around, to but I'm bringing him to every atmosphere because I already know hell's trying to fight and hell's trying to hunt. But we have an authority that's greater than every spirit that hell could send against our kids and against our family. And I tell you right now, every dad in this house, by the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of Jesus, I dare you to raise up a standard against every spirit that would come against your babies because we have the real thing and hell knows we have the real thing.
on the way here, he quoted to me Psalms 100 and Psalms 23. And you know that may be no big deal to you, but you don't know what I've been through. And the stories and the things that we heard. Oh, we'll see. I got shut up. So when I hear my little boy saying, the Lord is my shepherd, daddy, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, daddy. He leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares the table before me. Prince of mine enemies. Don't want to smite head with oil. Cup runneth over. You know what I decided to tell the enemy? You're going to burn. I'm not fighting you. I'm not arguing with you. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm going to keep loving and speaking life and praying and fasting over my kids. But I'm telling you right now, there's coming a day. When they're going to regret this attack, there's coming a day when they're going to wish they wouldn't have come against my baby. And if I have to die fasting for it, then I'll die. And I don't care what you think about it. I'm in a war with hell right now for my family's future. And so are you. And you ought to do everything you can do to say, God, save my children. Save my baby. Save my family. Somebody burn the snake in here right now. Somebody lift up your hands and get victory in the atmosphere right now. Mm. 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 Raise your hands if you have pain in your body by the authority of the Word of God and by the power of the name of Jesus. Release the work of miracles and the gifts of healing right now in this atmosphere. From the front to the back, somebody shout the name of Jesus right now. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. How long has the attack been there? And how bad do you want to be free? It's time to put the devil in his place. It's not just under your feet. It's in the fire. We go to the altar about everything except the thing we should be in the altar about. If I say come up here for financial blessings, the altar will be packed. Come up here for a miracle, altar will be packed. But come up here if you want the snake to let go. Oh. Come up here if you want the venom out. Come up here if you want deliverance. I want us all to stand right now if, it's, if we're able. I want us all to stand right now for Abel. You can't get free if you refuse to worship and you refuse to praise. Nobody can help you if you don't want out. But nothing can stop you if you do. 
And when the Lord tells me to do this, it's only on specific occasions, but I always try to obey with everything in me. But if you gave God everything you had for 30 seconds, I'm not talking the Pentecostal patty cake. I'm responding because you asked me to clap praise. I'm talking about something you don't normally do. If you normally do it, that's your routine. I'm talking about the praise that you do that's uncomfortable. I'm talking about shaking yourself, praise. Snapping out of it, praise. Snakes in the fire, praise. That when you give it to the Lord for 30 seconds, every demon that came in here with you will not leave here with you because the fire's about to start. Twenty-nine, twenty-eight, twenty-seven, twenty-six, twenty-five, twenty-four, twenty-three, twenty-two, twenty-one, twenty, nineteen, eighteen, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, shout! Let there be victory. Let there be victory. Let there be victory. Let there be victory. I dare you to get out of it. I dare you to snap out of it. I dare you to walk in the favor of God. We don't need music. There's a fire started in the atmosphere. Raise the blaze. Burn the snake. Shikata, he no tosata maha, he la la barojo socota la mahaya. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. He la barojo karashata. Now lay hands on your brother with free hands that are anointed by God. Now lay hands and speak in Jesus' name. Now pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. Come on, Bubba, pray it out. That's the Holy Ghost. Every spirit let go. God, take over. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, be delivered from drugs. Be delivered from fear. Be delivered from anger. Be delivered from bitterness. Be delivered from jealousy. Be delivered from hatred. You know what you're saying when you snap out of it? You're saying God's not through with me. God's not done with me. 
If you shake the snake off, you heal the sick people, Paul. In other words, when you get free, God can use you now. God can anoint you now. God can use you. Somebody's about to be used by God. Someone's about to be used by God. There's three of you that are so locked up right now, the devil's laughing because he's already had your demise plan. But I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that if you want to be free, no one around you will get you free. You've got to make up your mind. I've got to come out of this. I've got to be delivered. I've got to change. And no dirty looks you give me will work. I don't even know you, but I know the demons that are on you. And I promise you this, they don't like what they're hearing because they know if you just snap out of it, everything will turn around in your life. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. There's war in here. In Jesus' name, be delivered. Be delivered. Be delivered now. In the Nishadama, be delivered now. Be delivered now. Be delivered now. Now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. God must have plans for you. Spirit of suicide, get out of this room right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, spirit of suicide, get out of this room right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, spirit of suicide, get out of this room right now. Salam Well, I'm just fighting depression. Let me show you what depression. Depression's the arrow. Suicide's the bow. Depression's the symptom. Suicide's the spirit. Well, I don't know who it's in here, but it's on here. You will not die. You will live. We were on the elevator. My oldest son, Jude, is seven in Stockton, California. And Jude was about nine, uh, seven months old at the time. And we got on the elevator on a Saturday night. And this lady, me and my wife and the baby, and this lady get on the elevator behind us. And she was probably in her 50s, had a tank top and shorts on, had a glass of beer. And she looked at my boy and she said, how old is your son? And I said, he's seven months old. I didn't know she was a witch. And she said, Oh, what, when was he born? I said, oh, December 9th. She said, oh, he's a Sagittarius. My wife said, we don't do horoscopes. And instantly the lady raised her hands and started cursing my baby in tongues. Followed us out the lobby, Bishop, cursing all the way out the lobby. Raised her hands against us, cursing us as we got in her car. And the baby screamed all night long. My wife said, what's going on? He doesn't never do this. I said, she's praying against him. The next morning, God filled 72 people with the Holy Ghost. When they act up. Can I just give you a little revelation? Not that you need it. But demons don't know if you're going to leave the parking lot and go left or right. They don't know if you're going to eat at Chick-fil-A or Taco Bell. Okay? They don't know that. Stop giving them credit. I'll tell you what they do know. Demons know when angels are coming near you. Daniel 10, demons know when angels are coming near you. So they act up because they see heaven coming in. So if they're acting up, don't get upset. 
worship the Lord. They're only acting up because they see an invasion coming. Let him burn. Let him burn. The angel of the Lord met us in New Orleans. We landed. We got in the car late at night. We're going to drive to Mississippi to preach. I just preached that morning in Kansas City. A policeman pulls us over about 100 yards after we left the airport. I said, oh, man, I'm so tired. Is this a devil attacking me? The first thing I know about the policeman is he didn't know how to drive. He drove over the curb three times. Don't. And I thought, what is going on, God? You know we got to drive two more hours. We already preached. We have two babies. A third one on the way. We're exhausted. <laughs> Saturday night. He gets out of the car about seven foot tall, African-American man. He does this in my mirror. So I get out of the car. He has his arms folded behind my car. He just points at the car. And I said, yes, sir. So he kept pointing. Three times he pointed and never said anything. I said, I don't know. And he said, calm down, champ. He goes, I know you just got here. Praise the Lord. I said, what? He reaches down, and he hugs me, and he said, go get him tomorrow morning. And he smiled, got back in his car, drove over the curb, and drove away. And that morning, God filled 32 people with the Holy Ghost in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I feel like talking to you. Some of you are so comfortable. There are angels all in this room right now. The Lord is in this place. Be who you are. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Be who you are. And for the four non-praisers, when you're shouting Sunday during the game, Just know it was called out Friday night. But there's no football player that deserves your shout. Tom Brady didn't die for you. Jesus did. Aren't you thankful you serve the king of all? I know I'm being real, but I'm warring against spirits that are just trying to do this in here right now. I'll let you go with this. Let you go with this. They said, oh, when they saw it didn't kill him, they said, oh, this man is a god. They just said he's a murderer. And you survived the storm, the snake, and their mouth. Now they think you're a god. God's going to change some people's opinion about you. Not because you survived, not because you snapped out of it, but the thing that should be killing you isn't working anymore, and they're realizing something's in you that's greater than what was opposing you. So why don't you thank the Lord right now, because God's about to reverse the tide, and people are going to change their opinion. If you're waiting on the music to worship, I'm done being your cheerleader. Wow. 
What a great and a mighty God we serve. What a great, why don't we give him one more hand for everything that has happened today. This is for you, oh God. This is for you. For you, your word. God, I thank you, oh God. I thank you for change, oh God. I thank you, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. I think I say it every year. I don't know publicly, but to myself, that was the best one <laughs> we've ever been to. And I'm pro I, it just feels like I'm going to be saying it about this one. It's certainly trending in that direction with the things that we have heard thus far. I am so looking forward to tomorrow. Going to be gathered here at 930 for prayer. And we're just believing for very powerful things to continue to happen. Amen. Are you believing that with me? Amen. I believe that. I believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wish you would just go in his grace, his peace tonight. And let's come ready to have church tomorrow. And just see this thing off with a bang. God bless you. God bless you. God bless these wonderful men that have brought the word to us tonight. Brother J.B. Sims, my dad, Reverend Josh Herring. Powerful, powerful, powerful. God bless you.